Good evening and welcome to Primetime News, live here on News First. We're coming to you with the latest headline-making stories here at home and also around the world. I'm Mahina Bongzil. Very good evening. I'm Joel Outskun. We start off with a look at the headlines for this evening. New Chief Ministers for the Western and Northwestern Provinces. Nilangadala re-elected as the Diyavadana Nilami of the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic. News first, you reporter mauled to death by elephant in Mineria. <laughs> Mobile phone of rugby player Wasim Tajuddin recovered from Nuarelia. Farmers obstruct roads and demonstrate over the inability to sell their paddy harvests. In news from the President's Diary this evening, the International Summit on Climate Change commenced today under the auspices of President Maitripala Sirisena in Colombo. The President's Media Division said that Sri Lanka is the host nation of the International Summit on Climate Change. The International Summit on Climate Change and Adaptations is taking place under the aegis of the Western Provincial Council. Delegates from 37 countries from the African, American, European, Asian and Pacific region will attend the summit tomorrow. The summit mainly intends to establish contact with sub-national governments and reinforce the network in those continents by promoting the partnerships through mitigation and adaptation strategies regarding climate change with the participation of political and diplomatic representatives and other relevant stakeholders. In Sri Lanka, sectors such as agriculture, fisheries, coast conservation, irrigation, health, disaster management, power and energy and industry have shown vulnerability. Hence, it is imperative that the policies of adaptation reinforced by well-designed programs are put in place as a matter of urgency. It is estimated that uh, by the year 2070, climate change in Sri Lanka is likely to bring average temperatures to the highest level in the past 120 years and this extreme weather will undeniably cause irrepar irreparable damage to the environment. Unless we are alive to this reality and prepared to meet the challenge, the impending disaster will undoubtedly gather momentum to, to reach devastating proportions. Meanwhile, the newly constructed swimming pool at the Air Force Base in Watmalana was declared open by the President. <laughs> President Sirisena also engaged in an inspection tour of the complex during his visit. <laughs> Air Force personnel also showcased their swimming skills during the event. In some somber news this evening, a wild elephant in Samagipura, Mineria, claimed the life of yet another human today. Priyanta Ratnaika, who was mauled to death by a wild elephant, was a News First U reporter. Due to the graphic nature of the footage we are about to show you, the discretion is advised. Priyanta Ratnaika was passionate about his dream of becoming a journalist. His dream was realized when he joined the News First Uriport family. Later, he was recognized as a News First Eagle in the Pearl Narva district, an award given to recognize one's service towards the society and the communities they live in. The very dream he saw day in and day out also cut short his life while reporting on the human elephant conflict. Uh, 
Ada Priyanka Ratnayaka set off this morning to record footage of a wild elephant that charged into Samagipuram in area. Ratnayaka, who was chasing the elephant in order to fulfill his journalistic responsibility, was mauled by the elephant and fell victim. Ratnayaka suffered serious head injuries and succumbed upon admission to the Hinguragura Divisional Hospital. He was a 46-year-old father of three. The wild elephant who stormed into the village was later chased back into the wild after a joint effort by the wildlife officers of Mineria, police and area residents. The tusker journeyed from Samagipura to the Mineria town hampering traffic on the Batik Colombo main road for several hours. <laughs> Priyanta Ratnayaka put his life on the line to fulfill his responsibility towards society and breathed his last while on duty. Priyanta, may you rest in peace. Environmentalists are of the view that humans taking over lands from forest reserves have attributed to the rise in wild elephant attacks. During a visit, news first cameras captured the manner in which forest reserves have been taken over in several areas in the Hambantara district. This is land which bears a sign that it comes under the purview of the Department of Wildlife Conservation in the Hambantura district. However, when one enters the forest reserve, this is what can be witnessed. Locals in the area charged that outsiders had demarcated this land which is said to be a part of the forest reserve. News first today visited the Mattala, Kurudana, Katanwava and Kaliapura villages under the jurisdiction of the Hambantura Divisional Secretariat. Trees such as Margosa and Satinwood had been filled in these lands in addition to the preparations that have been made for constructions. Locals say that the construction only takes place during the weekends. This was home to many animal species. There are boats set up citing private property. Do not enter. Please inquire into this and provide us a solution. The animals do not have a forest to live in. This is our home. Where else can we go? Who owns these lands? Who is clearing the lands? Who authorized this act? The human-elephant conflict has escalated to a very serious level in many areas. As a result, humans and elephants pay for it with their lives. The arbitrary actions of the politicians, their acts to obtain votes and also the sale of lands to strengthen their financial situation has led to this human-elephant conflict. Even before the general elections, news first highlighted the fact that such persons must not be elected to parliament. However, some have been elected. We hope the incumbent government will look into this and punish those responsible. Farmers who are unable to sell their paddy harvest from the Ampara and Anuradhapura districts once again demonstrated on the streets today, obstructing traffic. The reasons for these demonstrations was that the Paddy Marketing Board had ceased the purchasing of paddy at several purchasing centres. Farmers demonstrated on the Ampara Candy Road once again today. 
Take a look at this. This letter states for an immediate payment to be made. It says that the payment must be made before the 15th. Another says that the payment must be made before the 20th. All this is on debt. During the elections, MPs and ministers will come and visit us and even have a cup of tea in our houses. However, today they don't even cite this area. Another group of farmers demonstrated at the Kongas Hande Junction in Central Camp area on the Ampar Uana Road, urging the government to purchase their paddy stocks. We have been here for over four days. There are no officials here and they say that the paddy will not be purchased. We have a meal of rice once in every six months. We have debt to pay. We have no way in paying for the labor. We have pawned the jewelry at the banks and have been rendered helpless. What are the authorities doing? Farmers cleared the roads after officials from the paddy marketing board arrived and made a promise to purchase their paddy stocks. Farmers from the Rajanganya project demonstrated a protest this morning in the Yaya 7 area on the Rajanganya Portland main road. We were told to bring our paddy stocks on Monday. When we came here, there was a notice saying that the purchasing has been suspended. For three days, the farmers have been inconvenienced as paddy was not purchased. If we cannot move the paddy stocks to the storage, we will have to sell them to the bestest man. The price of paddy had dropped from 30 rupees to 28 rupees. The price is reducing. Who will bear these losses? Up next is our investigative segment, Action TV. When one takes into consideration the issues that have arisen over the purchasing of paddy in the Amparo district, it is evident the paddy marketing board is moving backwards as an institution. Issues have been arising over the purchasing of paddy from the Amparo district and the paddy marketing board confirms that the issue is from the Galloway Agrarian Settlement during the 2012-2013 Maha season. Paddy harvesting takes place across 120,000 acres of land in the Amparo district and 59,000 of those acres belong to 40 agrarian settlements. During the 2012-2013 Ma season, there are only seven storage facilities that were to accommodate the paddy harvested by these 40 settlements. In addition, the paddy harvested from the areas outside of these 40 settlements are also brought to these storage facilities. As these storage facilities were not cleared on time, it led to many issues on storing paddy. The issue was highlighted by Action TV during that time. However, afterward, the paddy marketing board dispatched cargo containers for the first time to pick up the paddy harvest from the storage facilities. There were no issues during the yellow season of 2013. This was because the paddy marketing board had taken measures to clear the storage facilities on time for the new intake of paddy harvest. Moreover, in line with the Dad Kirul exhibition of 2013, two new storage facilities were declared open to cater to these 40 settlements. However, these two storage facilities were not taken to use during the next two seasons as the Paddy Marketing Board had cleared the seven other storage facilities on time. For the first time under the new government, during the Mahas season, the paddy stocks were purchased without an issue as there were more space left in the seven old storage facilities. However, for the first time, the two new storage facilities that was built in line with the Dadakural exhibition were taken to use. One of the productive initiatives undertaken by the Paddy Marketing Board during the recent Mars season was for the paddy to be transported to the storage facilities by agrarian organization representatives. However, on the 29th of June this year, these representatives of the agrarian organizations resorted to this measure. The Paddy Marketing Board had evaded paying these representatives a sum of 10 million rupees. The Paddy Marketing Board had also loaned a sum of 10 times of that to over 500 private loan mills, turning a blind eye to the payments due to the government by these mills. At a time when the Paddy Marketing Board is facing a helpless situation in the Ampara district, what have these mills that had obtained loans from the board been doing? Details on Action TV tomorrow. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching News First. The new chief ministers for the Western and Northwestern provinces were sworn in today in the, pres in the presence rather, of President Maitri Pala Surisena. Hisura Deva Priya was sworn in as the chief minister of the Western province. In 1991, he who represented the Mahajana Exat Perimuna at the local government elections once served as chairman of the Maharagama Pradesh Sabha. 
He was appointed to the Western Provincial Council for the first time in 1999. He has represented the Provincial Council three times since then. He was appointed to the post left vacant by former Chief Minister Prasanna Ranathunga, who was elected to Parliament. Dharma Siridhasan Aika was sworn in as the Chief Minister of the Northwestern Province. He is the former Chairman of the Northwestern Provincial Council. The post of the Chief Minister of the Northwestern Province was left vacant when Dayasuri Jayasekara was elected to Parliament. On to a story that made it to the headlines this evening, Pradeep Nilangadala was re-elected as the Diyavadana Nilame of the Temple of the Sacred Tooth Relic following an election for the post this evening. Incumbent Diyavadana Nilame, Pradeep Nilangadala, former Diyavadana Nilame, Niranjan Vijayvatna, and the Basnayaka Nilame of the Sri Nata Temple in Kandy, attorney at law Gayan Bantar Hinkenda contested for the post of Diyavadana Nilame. The name of Bas Nayaka Nilame, Vasika Sudanta Sena Nayaka, was nominated. However, was cast aside as the proposal was not seconded. Later, the name of Tarindu Takshila Dala was also nominated. However, he withdrew from the election. Dala secured 205 votes and was elected as the Diyawadana Nilame for the next 10 years. Several more ministers, deputy ministers and state ministers will be sworn in tomorrow. The swearing-in ceremony will take place at 2 p.m. tomorrow at the Presidential Secretariat. Moving on to more local news, convening a media briefing today, the Government Medical Officers Association revealed details of a racket that imports a certain drug to the country. This drug was imported in a cargo container carrying snuff. This was done once a month by a businessman. The most dangerous substance that can be found in snuff was included in these vials. No one was aware of the use of this. This is one such vial. The businessman is importing hundreds of thousands of these vials. Currently, these vials are in the custody of customs. The president decided that those responsible be apprehended and the law be strictly enforced. As no one was aware of the contents, this was sent to the National Dangerous Drugs Control Board. This is their report. It says that this file contains nicotine. In a latest twist to the controversy surrounding the death of rugby player Wasim Tajuddin, the mobile phone of Wasim Tajuddin, who died under suspicious circumstances in 2012, has been found in Norelia. <laughs> His mobile phone was found nearly three weeks ago by the Criminal Investigations Department in the possession of an individual in the Agarapatani area in Nuvarilia. This individual's father, who had found the mobile phone on a road in Kirulapana, had picked it up and given it to him. This was uncovered during investigations carried out by the CID. The case pertaining to the death will be taken up once again on the 10th of September. September uh, the current Sri Lankan economic climate was discussed at the interactive luncheon today organized by the American Chamber of Commerce in Sri Lanka. Former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State Richard Armitage chaired the event with the representatives from AmCham. AmCham members and a number of key figures in the Sri Lankan economy were present for the event. We were borrowing heavily from China and building roads and various types of infrastructure which are not sometimes being even used for its original purpose. So, we need to make sort of dramatic changes, right? Because unless we do so, I don't see how we can sustain even 6% growth. We thought we were growing at 8%, but we now realize we are only growing at 4%. So to take it to double digits, it's a huge challenge. We need to figure out how to use Sri Lanka as a, maybe a, a transit point. Minister of Finance Ravi Karunanayaka commented on the political change in Sri Lanka. We will certainly take notice of the information that is there because there are certain areas, the structural amendments that need to be done in Sri Lanka and the new government that has been elected. Firstly, on the January 8th, we got a new president. 
you brought in the sense of human decency and democratic governance that is there, the change of uh, approach in Sri Lanka, which is appreciated by all of you all, and I'm sure this is the investment for the future. All we want to do is to ensure the American investors look at Sri Lanka's opportunity. Responding to a question on the U.S. resolution on Sri Lanka, Richard Armitage had this to say. Uh, and I think to say that you'd be involved in the drafting would not be quite right. But to say that you were uninformed and you were, not, you were lacking the ability to have input would be not right. So I think it's going to be kind of halfway in between. In no way will the consensual resolution that we hope uh, will be support, uh, accepted and voted upon, which I think will be voted upon positively, in no way relieves Sri Lanka from the responsibility on accountability. The Hindu website says that a report on alleged human rights violations in Sri Lanka during the Elam War is likely to be presented on the 30th of September during the 30th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. It says according to the current timetable, it will be taken up during the third and final weeks of the council session, which starts on the 14th of September and concludes on the 2nd of October. Citing on Sri Lanka is expected to go on for three hours on the 30th of September. Prepared by the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights Investigation on Sri Lanka, the report is a result of a resolution adopted by the UNHRC in March 2014 requesting the Commissioner to undertake a comprehensive investigation into alleged violations and abuses of human rights and related crimes by both parties in Sri Lanka during the period covered by the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission. Do you recall the incident that took place at the Variopola bus stand last year that led to much controversy? <laughs> now this girl from Variopola who is seen in this video that went viral on social media attended a media briefing today. It was revealed that the male youth in question in the video was sentenced to six months of rigorous imprisonment after the case was taken up. In addition, court ordered him to pay a sum of 50,000 rupees to the girl, Tilini Amalka. I was about to head to Colombo on the 16th of August 2014 with a friend. He came next to us and said some things that were disgusting to listen. He even boarded the bus. He said one word and my friend chased him off the bus and followed him. He slapped him several times. Then the timekeeper came there. He too beat him. He told me that such persons can only be dealt with in this manner and that they had noticed him since morning. I was the third person to beat him. A fundamental rights petition was also filed at the Supreme Court against the Variopola police over this incident. I said that we'll visit the police headquarters and send a fax to Variapola police seeking further investigation. When I was stepping out, I received a phone call. They wanted me to visit the Variapola police on the 27th and provide a statement. Then the OIC received a phone call. And he said she arrived and she will be arrested. Then it was aired on the news. It said that I will be directed to the JMO as I have a mental illness that was mentioned by the OIC of Variapola. Injustice was caused to me there. We were subjected to mental stress by the police. As persons who travel in public transport and gather at public places, we have seen such incidents take place. Sometimes we think about our own situation and leave. However, I am proud that my daughter took a stand against it. The incident that took place at the police was similar to what Tilini underwent at the Variopola bus stand. I saw it with my own eyes. It is disgusting as to how the police treats a woman who enters the police for a certain issue. Now, News First contacted police media spokesperson S.P. Ruan Gunusekara in this regard. He said that as the offender pleaded guilty before court, he was handed down a sentence. As it was a legal procedure, the police media spokesperson refused for comment on the incident. Similar incidents went viral on social media over the recent past. 29th September 2014, woman known as Ratna Purabati assaulted by police officer. 
15th July 2015 quarrel between a female BMW driver and police Now on sports news the current Sri Lankan economic sorry that was not sports news but moving on to sports Sri Lanka's Mihilia Metsarani won the bronze medal in the squash singles event at the 2015 Commonwealth Youth Games Meanwhile Sri Lanka's Indika Disanayake came in second in group B of the 69th weight class at the 45th Asian Weightlifting Championships Well with that we wrap up the news tonight thank you for stopping by for the news team I'm Joel Outsgo and I'm Mahina Bongzel good night good night Thank you.